visiting all the points on the map and meeting hundreds of people along the way. I'm going to take you on a journey through five major areas of life in modern China. The political system, the economy, science and innovation, ecology and people's livelihood. Let's discover a China on the Politics, they say, should never be talked about over dinner, because it leads to family rows. It feels a bit like that for me now too, straddling two political cultures. For some in the US, Europe and elsewhere, China's political system is troubling by definition, because it's not an electoral democracy. It's a one-party dictatorship, as they see it. And that certainly is one take. But is it possible to talk about Chinese politics in a way that recognizes its internal logic, that respects where it has made achievements, most notably in terms of pulling millions out of poverty in recent years, that sees perhaps even where it has worked as well as other systems? We don't have to agree with it in whole, but understanding it on its own terms is probably useful. The National Two Sessions is the political event of the year in China. Deputies and members from across China meet in Beijing for one to two weeks each March to debate and discuss big issues. The National Two Sessions includes the annual sessions of the National People's Congress, NPC, and the National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, CPPCC. Because the duration of the two meetings coincides, it's referred to as the two sessions. As China's highest legislative body, the NPC's main functions include legislation, supervision, appointment, autumn period, they all argue that the thinkers that we, we should try to select public officials with above, with above uh, average ability and virtue. The most important virtue of public officials is the willingness uh, and to, to serve the people with a kind of legalist emphasis on getting the job done well in an efficient way. So how are these NPC deputies and CPPCC members selected? An expert on China issues. Robert Lawrence Kuhn wrote about China's reform and opening up in his book, The Inside Story of China's 30-Year Reform. Uh, all of the delegates are appointed or elected from lower levels, so it represents the whole country. It's divided into different categories of people who, who have uh, represent all segments of society, from elite entrepreneurs to farmers and soldiers, very classically, uh, in the whole country. The two sessions brings more than 5,000 participants from across the country to Beijing, where they wield power on behalf of a population of 1.4 billion. But who are they exactly? And what kinds of issues do they have influence over? I've come to Yunnan to meet one of the CPPCC members. Xi Jinping comes from the Jinu ethnic group. In 1979, China's last minority to be officially recognized. Locally born and raised, she's worked in the Jinu Mountain Township Health Center since graduating from nursing school 26 years ago. It's precisely because of her familiarity with the region and the trust of the villagers that she was selected by the CPPCC's standing committee to serve as a CPPCC member five years ago. Now she's working on the new research. Uh, 
后今年打算除掉茶叶以外，还得做点什么？我做点徒步啊，带他们去徒步啊，我搞创意嘛。哦哦哦，也是吸引外边的人来这边旅游了。哦，对对。Zianping is planning to put together a proposal to boost the Jino people's prospects, protecting their local culture and giving them more economic opportunities. If she wants to bring her dream alive, though, she has a lot of research to do. This is called Jino Dagu. 啊、呃，然后金诺大鼓舞呢，也是我们一个吉祥，主要是我们在那个金诺族的重大的节庆过节，就是我们相当于汉族的人，嗯嗯嗯，就是这种，每个村村寨寨的都会跳这个金诺大鼓。Her ultimate plan is to somehow boost the economy of her hometown by turning it into what is known as a national model township of rural revitalization. That you usually do a year of planning? At least three to six months. Okay. To have a developed plan. Can you do it yourself? I do it myself. I have to go to many departments to collect some data and some statistics. 像我在基层嘛、嗯，我要反映的是我们最基层的群众的一些需求。After doing the research, Zian Ping is now putting together a proposal that collates all the information she collected. It's her job to take into account opinions from across the range before submitting it. The two sessions in 2022 arrives as scheduled. Zian Ping attends her last CPPCC meeting in Jino costume. An expert on China issues, Martin Jack has analyzed the similarities and differences between the Chinese and various Western political models. One of the striking characteristics of Chinese governance is basically it's very professional. It's very well informed. Uh, uh, that's why it managed, has managed to do what it's managed to do. And you only do that if you draw on many people across society, uh, particularly those with expertise. Broadly speaking, China's political system, in essence, has um, uh, four parts. It has the party, which is overall in its overall policies and direction. It has the government which is the uh, executive function of, of running everything, whether it's at the national level or the provincial local level. And it has these two bodies, that one is a legislator and one is a political consultative conference. So if you put all four together, it, is, it represents the Chinese system. In any political system, one of the central questions is how to ensure that people's voices are heard. The needs of different demographics are not always in harmony. Where does the balance lie? In a country with a population of 1.4 billion, that becomes an even more pressing issue. China's two sessions features voices from across the country, including representatives from minority rural communities like the Jinhua of Xishuangbanna, as well as the concrete jungles of some of the country and the world's busiest business districts. The Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area is one of only four major Bay Areas in the world. It's the largest and richest economic region in southern China, and the focus, along with the Yangtze River Delta, the Chengdu Chongqing Economic Circle, and the Beijing Tianjin Hebei region, of major regional development strategies in the 14th Five Year Plan, China's most recent iteration of its social and economic initiatives for the near term future. Central planning like this is a key component of socialist market economies, a pillar of what China calls socialism with Chinese characteristics. The government's ability to centrally guide the development of areas this huge, this one has a population of over 80 million, is seen by many inside and outside China as key to the recent success story of China's economy. But the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area is about more than just the economy. For China, 
It's proof of concept for the idea we've heard so much about since Hong Kong returned to China in 1997. One country, two systems. A concept that now also comprises three custom zones and three currencies. When it comes to the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area and the one country, two systems policy, there are perhaps very few people with as much relevant experience as Luong Chongying, former chief executive of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. I met him in Guangzhou. The interesting thing about this um, uh, Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area compared to other Greater Bay Areas, for example, the Greater Bay Area around San Francisco, the Tokyo Bay Area, is that the 11 cities, nine in Guangdong plus Hong Kong, Macau, belong to two uh, different and separate uh, political and syst uh, uh, social uh, systems, two separate economic systems. I'm sure there are a list of successes. What are the challenges uh, in this system still? The biggest challenge that we face in the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area uh, is the existence of the two systems within the one country. So on the one hand, you could see that as challenges, obstacles, yeah. um, the barriers uh, for greater collaboration. But once you find the keys to unlocking the, uh, uh, the potential by sort of bridging over differences between the two systems, you have the, the new power to drive developments forward. Shenzhen is a world center for electronic technology with a leading position in electronic information, 5G communication, integrated circuits, cloud computing, and the Internet of Things. For young people looking to make their move in tech innovation and entrepreneurship, this place offers what they call a complete industry chain. I'm in the Tianhai Shenzhen Hong Kong Youth Innovation and Entrepreneur Hub in Shenzhen. It supports young people from Guangdong, Hong Kong and Macau to start their own businesses in the fields of intelligent hardware, mobile internet and cultural creativity. Hello. Hey, good to meet you. How are you doing? Yeah, good, good, good. good. Okay. Basically, we are able to monitor the safety, the health, and also, like, if emergency, they will have call for SOS, right? Hong Kong native Roger Yu founded Team Concepts Technology to provide Internet of Things solutions for life and health monitoring and management of workers in coal mines and power generation. After graduating from the University of California, he chose Hong Kong to incubate the project and arrived at the Shenzhen Hub in 2015. So tell me a little bit, Roger, about how you ended up in Shenzhen. During that time, I will need to be in Shenzhen a lot of times as well, because like uh, we sell products, consumer products to overseas, right? But where you're manufacturing it is actually in Shenzhen. And that's why that attracts me. Liu Chunying, then chief executive of Hong Kong, attended the opening ceremony of the hub in 2014. I'm wondering why such a small development was so important to him. Shanghai is right next to Hong Kong and there's one very important uh, factor that Hong Kong doesn't have and this is land resource. The second, uh, which probably is equally important advantage that Shanghai offers, uh, are privileges, special government policies that are parts of, say, uh, Shenzhen. Uh, do not uh, offer. The Hub and Bank of China have also launched a process to speed up approval of cross-border funds and cross-currency settlement for the entrepreneurs here. China has an old saying, once everything is ready, all we need is an east wind. For all the policies and enticements, ultimately, sales are the east wind. So how's it going for tenants? During that time, I got my first uh, representable uh, order from actually the what we call Shanghai Shuidao. It's like they're like a China Fortune 500 company. They're building the first underground sea tunnel in Shenzhen, and they're really interested on in what we are doing, and they want to deploy it and apply it to their worksite. On a Friday afternoon, while the hub was hosting a market for its tenants. A lecture was in full swing in Sha Ting, Hong Kong. 
talking about how the policies of the Greater Bay Area are geared towards supporting what they call youth innovation and entrepreneurship. So 12 it's one of the regions with the highest degree of openness and the strongest economic vitality in China. Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area is extremely important. Let's, let's look at some statistics. I think the GDP, uh, last time I looked, was about $1.7 trillion. It would almost be in the top 10 in the world. So it's very powerful. The Greater Bay Area has come a long way in just a few years. But a radical new system was never going to be perfected overnight. Institutional innovation needs to be tested and adjusted through practice. This kind of long-term thinking, where experimentation applied on small or pilot projects, then adjusted and rolled out more widely, is a characteristic of the Chinese system, and it's most clearly successful. China's political system consists of what it describes as one fundamental political system and three basic political systems. The fundamental political system is the system of the National People's Congress, the legislative body that sits at the top of the chain. The three basic political systems are what in China is called multi-party cooperation and political consultation under the leadership of the Communist Party of China, the system of regional ethnic autonomy, and the system of community-level self-governance. So, at the bottom of the system, is there a mechanism for regular people to exercise power in any meaningful way? Today, I'm in Shanghai's Hongqiao sub-district, where an experiment is taking place to implement something that President Xi Jinping called Whole Process People's Democracy when he visited here in 2019. Wu Xinhui is a lawyer but she also works as a legislative worker for the community. Today, she's soliciting opinions on a draft bill about telecom and online fraud prevention. In Hongqiao Subdistrict was designated one of the first grassroots legislation opinion collection stations by the NPC Standing Committee. Its job is to consolidate and discuss feedback from local residents at neighborhood meetings. Wu Xinhui is taking me to one such meeting. Tai很嚣张 one participant stands out. He's Turkish and has been in China for 40 years, longer even than me. 
，一个人丢了他的三强的百分之十，还是百分之二十，还是全部，是算那个重大的损失吗？那么老百姓，你觉得通过你自己的经验吗？他们也有感觉是真的有影响吗？我好多建议已经被采纳了，所以就我我可以说，是的，是的。嗯它是直通车，直通车、嗯。什么叫直通车呢？直通车就是我老百姓收集的意见以后，我是可以直接到全国人大。To better understand this process, I visit Cui Lixia, Deputy Secretary of CPC Work Committee of Hongqiao Subdistrict. 欢迎你来到国会市民中。我们现在为止啊，已经听了六十部法律草案，然后的话上报的意见一千一百八十五条，其中我们很非常荣幸，已经九十八条被采纳了。The Hongqiao Subdistrict we visited was one of the first opinion collection stations set up in China. To date, a total of twenty-two stations have been set up by the National People's Congress, covering two-thirds of the provinces in China. I also wrote down one of my suggestions for Shanghai. In the visitor's book, obviously, if we use the Western definition of democracy, then China is not very democratic.、Um, but even if you use that definition of politics by the people,、um, we, and we think of democracy not just as elections, but other mechanisms, including consultation and deliberation,、uh, using survey data to assess people's needs, then arguably there's some democracy in China, but it still won't be in a form that will be recognized by the West. So it's important to understand is what does China mean by the word democracy? The objective is the same, and that is to do the best for the people of the country, the citizens of the country, to、uh, provide them with an increasing standard of living, with fulfilling lives, with dealing with problems like medical or retirement. Every every country deals with these issues. China's recent ability to innovate and reinvent itself is derived in big part from its distinct political system. And as the country explores and adapts the various elements of that system, experimenting with new ideas and discarding others along the way, not everything will succeed. But some of them will, and some clearly are already. It's important to select to have a good representative group of public officials. China's approach to democracy is different. The goal is the same: benefit to their own citizens. The present system, actually, I think, is a modern form in some respects of the traditional Chinese system, which is basically of the highest caliber. Is everything perfect? No, of course it's not perfect. Don't know anybody in China who thinks things are perfect. But has it been a gigantic step forward? Yeah, the facts show. Yes.